I'm Greg Kutsona from Science for the Church, and I've got a really great guest uh, this afternoon, Curtis Chang. Let me tell you about Curtis using the official uh, biography on the website christiansandthevaccine.com. As a theologian, Curtis is on the faculty of, the, of Duke Divinity School and is a senior fellow at Fuller Theological Seminary. His ministry experience includes serving as a senior pastor of an evangelical covenant church in California. He's also been a campus minister with University Christian Fellowship and has done mission work in Soweto, South Africa. He's authored or contributed to multiple books, including Engaging Unbelief, a captivating strategy from Augustine <clears throat> and Aquinas. I'm gonna do that one more time just because I wanna make sure I get that right. Engaging Unbelief, a captivating strategy from Augustine and Aquinas with InterVarsity Press. Curtis, and I love this, is fueled by a passion to help Christians recognizing, recognize the surprising authority and relevance of Jesus for parts of life that are often left to the secular world. His biblical insights are enriched by his own secular career, which includes founding an award-winning consulting firm to nonprofits called Consulting Within Reach. Curtis graduated from Harvard University and is a former Rockefeller fellow. fellow let's try it again. And is a former Rockefeller fellow. So Curtis, welcome. And I really want to hear from you and uh, this work you're doing with COVID-19 vaccinations. It's great to have you. Thanks. It's so great to be here. Uh, that was a, a lovely introduction. And thanks for sharing my bio. And Maybe if I could flesh out that bio just with a little more context, that could explain Please do. how I led to this work on the vaccine. So I think the best way to understand me is somebody that has always felt called to be straddling between the worlds of secular public institutions and the church. So I began my career in the church. I was on InterVarsity staff, and then I was a senior pastor of an evangelical covenant church in California, and even now, have these faculty appointments at Duke and, and at Fuller. But for the last 15 years, I've actually led my own consulting firm that serves secular nonprofits and government agencies, including many that work in public health. Mm. And so I've really felt like my calling is to be standing at the intersection between these two worlds of secular institutions and the church. And that's what led me to the vaccine work because mm. at, about several months ago at the end of December, um, I was talking with the CEO of a secular public health agency, which is, was one of my clients, and she was really concerned and, about vaccine um, distribution and, and whether or not you know, their plans were the right ones. And she was especially concerned about the, their ability to reach the Latino population where I live. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I'm, just, I'm hearing rumblings about their hesitancy or suspicion, but I don't really understand it. Can you, Curtis, give me, shed any light on that? And so I asked her, I said, well, do you understand anything about uh, the pro-life concerns regarding the vaccine? And she had this, this dumbfounded look. She goes, what, what does the vaccine have anything to do with abortion? Hmm. And so I had to explain to her, like, look, half of the, the Latinos in our county are Catholics, hmm. and they're going to be really sensitive to the um, reality that there is a distant connection between the vaccines and the abortion. And that's going to get played up in a lot of the suspicion and misinformation. Of, and you're going to need to have an answer for that, or, or our efforts are going to need to have an answer for that. And then I said, do you, does the term mark of the beast mean anything to you? And she had, again, this dumbfounded look on her face. I said, all right, you've got to understand the other half of the Latino population are probably Pentecostals. And that term, mark of the beast, is going to be co both code and belief for a lot of their distrust and suspicions around the vaccine. And it was clear to me talking with her that the secular public health infrastructure completely was unprepared for how to deal with this. And, and that was not even taking into account that they weren't even thinking about white evangelicals. They were solely thinking in terms of outreach to black and brown communities. Mm -hmm. And that these same concerns were gonna be even more magnified among the white evangelical community. And I realized that this was a moment like when, you know, when God rings the bell and you realize, oh, this is my bell. I've got to answer this. That as somebody that stands at the intersection between the two, two worlds, I needed to actually step up myself and try to produce resources and information that would actually make the bridge between these two worlds and help especially Christians, uh, especially conservative evangelicals 
to be able to be persuaded to take the vaccine, which is really the critical public health issue facing the world today is what conservative, primarily white evangelicals decide around the vaccine. You know, the, the pathway to ending the pandemic runs through the evangelical church. I, I was just told last night, uh, I was talking with a friend of mine who attends a uh, large evangelical church in the city of Chico. And he was saying that in uh, reading about where the vaccinations are right now, this actually, just to underline what you just said, it, the white evangelical population is critical. It may actually be at least in the United States, perhaps the linchpin to creating herd uh, immunity or not. Is that accurate, Curtis? Completely accurate. It, it's, it goes even deeper than that. So just statistically, in the latest Pew Research findings from February showed that 45% of white evangelicals say they are not likely to get the vaccine. That's 45%. Now keep in mind, about 25 to 30% of Americans self-identify as evangelical. So about half of that population are leaning away from taking the vaccine, which means you've got 12, 13% that's already saying no to the vaccine. Now, you know, Fauci and others are estimating the vaccination rates necessary to achieve herd immunity is somewhere in the 80% category. Mm. So right away, conservative white evangelicals represent a major obstacle to reaching herd immunity. That's why I say the pathway runs through the evangelical church. It goes deeper than that even. Uh, from the level of even beyond herd immunity, if you have a subpopulation in the United States that is allowing the virus to go replicate unchecked within its community, which is what happens if you know, a large community goes mostly unvaccinated, that's a perfect recipe for the virus to develop variants, to develop mutations that can ultimately be more lethal and, and this is a real scary scenario, develop resistance to the vaccine itself. Right. And this is why I've been trying to tell the secular public health officials, you're, I know you're not used to paying attention you don't, to white evangelicals, you don't understand them, and perhaps you even have some, some distaste for them for political reasons or whatsoever. But just for your self-interest and for the interest of the whole society, you've got to pay attention to them. They really matter. And if you ignore them, that is to the peril of all of us. I'll say one last thing. I, the issue and the threat is not just in the United States. Because one of the great exports, and I put great uh, uh, somewhat in quotes here, mm -hmm. one of the uh, most influential, let's say, exports of America is actually evangelical theology. If you go to Africa, uh, Latin America, uh, many parts of those, grow, especially the parts of the churches that are growing the fastest, the Pentecostal movements especially, they take their theological cues uh, from the United States, from the United States evangelical and Pentecostal movements. And so we are already exporting our vaccine suspicion and hesitance. I have a good, strong, a close colleague who works in Uganda in, the, in one of the regions that uh, is heavily uh, influenced by evangelical and Pentecostal theology. He was telling me that their, their local hospital have received 5,000 doses of the vaccine. They've only been able to give away 500 of them mm. uh, precisely because of all of this vaccine suspicion uh, and distrust. Wow, wow. So we can export all kinds of, um, I'm gonna use the word deleterious, somehow that comes to mind, things that can be really harmful to other countries and communities and ultimately to the, the world in which we live and as we know, uh, which God loves. And God, you know, right. God loves the world. And uh, I, I'll bring my own theology, you can see if you wanna own it too, but that our call is to love the world in the same way Jesus loved the world. And, um, uh, and so it's, it's important to be part of the solution, not the problem, I would imagine. Um, Absolutely, and, we, and we've got to start now, and it's the responsibility of Christians, especially Christian leaders, but all Christians to be actually stepping up in this moment to actually engage those who are doubtful and suspicious because the, the persuasion is going to have to come from us. Mm -hmm. it, it is not going to come from secular institutions and public health because of the history of distrust that has built up between the church and secular institutions, especially in public health, that has only intensified in this past year of the pandemic. Right. Uh, so it's, it's gotta have to be an internal calling. We've all gotta answer the bell in terms of getting our house in order to both take the vaccine and love our neighbor by taking the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's uh, you were quoted recently in the New York Times in an article with a common friend of ours, Lane Howard Eklund, and she was saying that 
this is in a way the distrust of science, but even more the lack of diversity in science uh, among certain religious communities that's coming home to roost in a certain way. So because many evangelicals aren't represented in science in certain contexts, this may be one of the, one of the outcomes. But um, part of what you've done, which is so powerful is to engage another person at the crossroads, Francis Collins, who um, you know, is an evangelical uh, in his own self-description and has also obviously at the, at the tip of the spear as it were in taking on uh, this pandemic. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, what a figure like Francis Collins can mean as we seek to fight the pandemic? And then pulling it down a little bit, how does he embody values that we as Christians, especially evangelical Christians, can bring to our context, uh, our faith communities? Yeah, great question. So like I said, it has to be voices from within the evangelical community that are going to have the credibility and the trust. And that's why when we created ChristiansInTheVaccine.com, which is a website that has all of our great website, videos. by the way. Can I just say that's a fabulous resource, ChristiansInTheVaccine.com. I had to interrupt because that's so important. Uh, please go ahead, though. Yeah, no, thank you. So that's the project that I've been working on. That was my sort of answering the bell here, was to create ChristiansInTheVaccine.com, where we have produced short, shareable videos that address some of the most common questions that Christians have, especially from a spiritual perspective, like the fear that it's a mark of the beast. Like, can you be pro-life and pro-vaccine? Is the vaccine a form of government control? Got short videos that Christians can view and share to answer these questions. And then when we got to the science-related, the medical-related fears and questions, we thought there's one person that we most need to get, and that's Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, who oversaw the development of the vaccines. And he was so kind and gracious to do a video with us that's really short, it's about eight minutes. I as far as I know, it is the shortest produced interview segment with Francis Collins that, and we deliberately wanted to keep it short so it could be shared on social media readily. And so I encourage folks to check that video out on christiansandthevaccine.com where they can uh, watch that video and, and pass it along to their friends. Can I just add to that? Uh, I actually just watched it in preparation for this conversation. There is so much in there in a good way. I mean, you're able to cover the critical questions uh, that you, some of what you touched on, you know, how does, how do, uh, about questions of trust, questions of, um, you know, is this vaccine going to change our DNA? No, it won't. You know, other things that have been really concerning for Christians, uh, especially evangelical Christians. So Curtis, if you don't mind, I, I wanna ask you just a little further. I mentioned the word trust and uh, I know that's a really critical issue. You've, you've touched on it without actually using the word I think so far, but can you say a little bit more about the importance of trust in uh, the COVID-19 vaccination yeah. you know, outreach? Yeah, so I think this is crucial because, and to do that, let me speak a little uh, biographically for a moment here. So I became a Christian in a conservative, you might even say fundamentalist, uh, Christian church in, in the Midwest. Mm. And uh, so I imbibed growing up the cultural tendencies of conservative evangelicaldom. And one of those cultural tendencies is, and, and let me put this precisely, I would say it is a tendency to be on your guard against the dominant secular institutions of the day. It is a tendency mm. to be on your guard. I certainly embraced that uh, and was formed by that. But that didn't stop me from actually engaging healthily with secular institutions. So when I got into Harvard, I attended with the full blessing and support of my church. And when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, I experienced firsthand why we actually Christians need to be somewhat on guard from all of the prevailing dogma that gets uh, you know, pushed out by secular institutions. But that didn't stop me from engaging healthily and critically and even using that sort of tendency to be at least on guard to, be, to ask critical questions and make even perhaps helpful uh, counter arguments to the prevailing dogma of Harvard in the day. Right. Now that, is very, that, that cultural tendency to be on guard has gotten transmuted in the last five years into something totally different. It has gotten, that tendency has gotten exploited by external forces to the church to become mutated into a massive seething uh, pot of distrust of a reflexive distrust of everything uh, and every any, and any secular institution. Um, and we can, you know, there's multiple reasons for that, but really quickly, I would say there's three big factors that of external factors that have exploited 
this cultural tendency. You know, certainly politics mm -hmm. uh, has done that, where conservative politicians uh, have exploited that that uh, tendency and 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 conditioned uh, Christians to distrust secular institutions uh, across the board. Conservative media has exploited that to get our ratings because it's trying to actually stir up our that that fear into greater uh, levels so that we'll watch conservative media. And then finally, external social media um, conspiracy uh, movements like QAnon and now the anti-vaccine movement mm. have also seized upon this. And so what that has created is something that to me is unrecognizable uh, as an evangelical, which is not that cult cultural tendency to be on guard, but rather a reflexive, massive, automatic distrust of everything. And here's the problem. If you've been conditioned to distrust everything, you will believe anything. Right? Because there's no guardrails. There's no against any of the, the craziest theory that might come along. So, a, you know, a prevailing conspiracy theory is there's a tracking chip in the vaccine. Right. You and I would go look on the and say, well, there's no major newspaper that has that has validated this. In fact, has debunked that. Well, if you distrust secular media uh, and journalism, that doesn't matter. You know, you would say, well, the FDA would never approve that. Doesn't matter. You disprove that. You know, so down the road, if you if you distrust everything and all institutions, you are vulnerable to believing anything. And that is really what is happening right now in the evangelical community is that vulnerability is getting exploited by especially the anti-vaxxer movement, mm -hmm. which very deliberately, very in a very highly organized way is targeting conservative evangelicals um, to buy into the anti-vaxxing conspiracy and fear. So we've given away our votes to, uh, to the outside forces of conservative partisan politics. We've given away our eyeballs to conservative media, and now we're, we're at risk of giving away our bodies mm. to, this, to these external forces. And this is why I think the moment is now for Christian leaders, Christian pastors, Christian scientists, Christian leaders to step up and say, no, this, we, we've got to stop this. We've, we've got to protect our flock uh, from the, in the John 10 verse, from the thieves and wolves who would steal and destroy uh, and say, we have to recapture our hearts and minds of our people uh, for the truth, for scripture, and, and against all of these efforts to condition and exploit our tendencies. Well, and I think the work that you've done with ChristiansInTheVaccine.com is really important in that. And uh, I, I, I would just say for our organization, Science for the Church, we very much want to be bringing the best insights of science to Christian congregations. And it does seem like one of these moments uh, where there is a particular need for, for good science to be brought for the health of congregations, literally, um, figuratively, but also along the lines uh, of being good Samaritans, uh, as Jesus describes it, you know, being good to our neighbor is more, more clear, you know, that we're, we're not doing this for ourselves as much even as we're doing it for other people. Like I always think of my friend Janice, who had major surgery and uh, chemotherapy after cancer surgery. And the reason I wore a mask uh, was not even primarily for myself. The reason I social distanced, the reason I used hand sanitizer, et cetera, was not for primarily for myself as much as it was for people like Janice who needs to uh, not be infected to be really direct. And by my unwillingness to practice uh, you know, good uh, protocols, I was putting her at risk. And now if we're not getting vaccinated, that can do exactly the same thing, but at a much more uh, intense level, because here we have the opportunity really to take a decisive step. Um, that's right. And, and, and that's where, you know, I think it's, it's for the world and for people who are vulnerable, but it's also honestly for us to get back to the church life, the community life as the body of Christ that we were intended. Because what will get us back to being able to worship together, not on Zoom, but actually in person, seeing in person and taking communion in person, it's going to be when we as a church and as individual churches are unified together in our approach to the vaccine. Because there's this sort of uh, mantra among conservative evangelicals that we encounter all the time in our work with Christians of the vaccine, where people are saying, don't tell me what to do. It's your, you know, th they might grant everybody can make their own decision, uh, but, like, but don't tell me what to do, um, and that it should just be an individual decision. Mm. Unfortunately, that's not what the body of Christ embodies. It's not that we are left alone and disconnected for us all to make our own individual choices. The whole concept and truth of the body of the Christ is we're interconnected and our decisions affect one another just exactly the way you mentioned. 
And this is actually critical to understanding the vaccine, that the vaccine protects a church and its church members most powerfully when that church is united together on it, right? Because the vaccine, it's a very effective, but it is not a perfect shield, right? You, it's, it's almost like a partial shield. It has 60, 70, 75% efficacy of protection against infection. That's very good for a vaccine, but it's not perfect. Now, with each additional person that gets vaccinated in the church, that, that vulnerability goes down. It's like that Philippians 127 verse uh, where Paul encourages the church to stand unified in that image of the Roman phalanx locking shields, right? It's that same idea. It's like, well, my shield is only going to cover me this far. I'm depending on the person next to me to take on the shield of the vaccine that will protect that person, but also my exposure as well, such that if the majority of a church uh, gets vaccinated, the risk to any one member of getting infected and getting sick sick goes down dramatically, almost to minuscule numbers. Mm. Well, and I think uh, this takes on one of one of the factors in our in our American culture that is really problematic, which is this individualism. And uh, if I could draw from one of my professors in undergrad, uh, Robert Bella, the ontological individualism that meaning that we are ultimately an individual, like that is the core of who we are, which of course is not the way the Bible sees us, as you so well put with the body of Christ imagery, not only imagery, but truth that's described, but even just like functionally, you know, we're born to a mother, you know what I mean? So we are cared for by parents or by caregivers when we're young. And my point is, uh, it's really, I think we're facing up to the limits of what American individualism can do. And, and also some of the, the really, not just flat sides, but actually dangerous sides of overemphasizing the individual. Right. And I think that's where, you know, in Bella's terms, the habits of the heart, right, of not just our wider society, but the habits of the heart of the evangelical theology is in some ways partially responsible for that. Mm -hmm. When we so emphasize as evangelicals, the individual private relationship with God as the end all and be all of Christianity, we're doing a great disservice to the gospel uh, that it's, it, it certainly includes our individual privatized relationship but it's not that solely. And we're running into that uh, distorted understanding of the faith in our work on the vaccine, because we, we hear all the time from, and then this is especially true among, I would say among Pentecostals, but it's true across the board, I think among uh, the different variants of evangelicalism, you know, this notion that you, you discuss and then the, the sort of uh, response is, well, I prayed about it and God told me, no, I don't, I shouldn't take the vaccine. And that's like it. That's the end of the conversation. Um, and it's this hyper individual privatized. I prayed about it. I sensed internally somewhere disquiet and there's no ability to actually sort through. Is that just your own fears getting mass, getting kind of projected onto God? Um, it's just like, no, it was, I, I heard it from God and therefore end of discussion. I don't, and I shouldn't uh, take the vaccine. And so this notion that our, our access to God and our access to truth is not solely brought about in a you know, isolated room with me and God alone, but that actually involves scientists in the church, involves the broader revealed revelation of God to the world that is accessible to scientists. You know, all of that is screened out from this hyper-individual uh, privatized understanding of how we relate to God and truth. Yes, and, and one of the questions, Curtis, it's really, important in light of that is how do we operate together um, as a church, as a church community? And I mean, I hope operate is not too cold a word, but how do we love? How do we care for one another? Uh, I have a friend, uh, many friends are pastors. I'm, I'm uh, an ordained, I've served as an ordained pastor. And so I keep in touch with people uh, who are in the, in the world of being pastors. And they tell me, it's not even like there's two sides to this uh, vaccination issue or COVID specifically, or sorry, generally, it's like there's five sides, you know, um, it's really a spectrum and to try to even form, this is not their language, but my language, a coalition can be really challenging because as soon as you get say two of the five, you're gonna be upsetting three of the other uh, five of that, you know, that, of, that, of those groupings. In other words, again, thinking of like a spectrum, there's very, there's different extremes, but even in the middle, there seems to be some variation. So what, what advice do you have for churches that have divisions within the church on this topic? And I know, I mean, you said it clearly in your videos, I'll say it clearly, I'm pro-vaccination. I trust people like Francis Collins and many, many others 
who support vaccination as Christians. Um, so how do we do we connect with a congregation where there are people who have a diversity of opinion? How do we live that out as the body of Christ? That's such a great question, Greg. And I, I so appreciate your sensitivity to the dilemma of a pastor in this cultural and political moment. I'm a former senior pastor myself, and I know right now, if I was still the pastor, uh, and I still attend this, the same church that I was a senior pastor at, so if I was still the senior pastor and I got up myself uh, and preached on Sunday morning about the vaccine, uh, and I'm in a progressive, what you might call a progressive, I'm in the, my church is in the Bay Area, so it's on the progressive end of evangelicalism, I know I would be getting like five emails on Monday morning from irate, uh, angry uh, parishioners, uh, and they would all cover the same issues. You know, you know how how can you be pro vaccine? Don't you realize there's baby parts in it? Don't you realize the mark of the beast, government control, all of it? I know I'd be getting all of that uh, in my inbox. Now imagine, you know, that's me, evangelical pastor in the Bay Area. Imagine what a pastor in Texas or Georgia or South Carolina is facing, and you can understand why they're they're concerned and, and nervous about coming out very publicly in favor of the vaccine, even though they themselves are probably statistically almost certainly in favor of the vaccine. Uh, uh, there was a survey done, and let me take a slight digression here because there, this is important for the point. There was a survey done in January among evangelical pastors by the Evangelical Leader Survey. 95% of evangelical pastors say they, want, they will take the vaccine when offered to them, 95%. Wow. That's in contrast to only 55% of the base. Right? So there's this massive gap between the leadership, the pastoral leadership, and the base, because that base has gotten exposed to all these external forces of distrust that are, that's, that's trying to exploit their distrust that I'm talking about. And pastors are outgunned. You know, as a pastor, I have my people for maybe an hour and a half on Sunday morning. Fox News has them for 20. And um, social media has them at their fingertips in a way that I, I, I don't have. Right. And so pastors, understandably, are really nervous about coming out when they know their base, their members, are hearing and being influenced uh, by all these external forces that are going to make them very angry with, with a particular message. And this is why when we created ChristiansInTheVaccine.com, we very deliberately pursue the strategy of creating short, shareable videos. Because we are saying, we're actually, if you go, we have a part of our site that's for the pastor's toolkit. And in the pastor's toolkit, we, we actually advise pastors, probably not a good idea to preach about this on Sunday morning, precisely because you're going to have this you know, sort of massive blowback. You know, instead, look for more subtle ways to pastor your people. And that's why we created these videos, so that they can, if they get an, a, an email or they hear in a conversation from somebody about some distress, they can just email them that video, or they can post this video on social media. And they can say something like, I think this is a really great video. I may not agree with everything in it so that you get some cover, um, but then you say, but I still really think it's really helpful. Like, there's a lot of ways that, that, that pastors can still um, kind of bring into play the trusted role they still do have, right. uh, but then not have to do provide all of the information themselves verbally or in, in their own email. So we wanted to actually take the load off of the pastors by for us providing the information, providing the short shareable comment, and just let the pastor play the role of a trusted relationship. Because that's the key ingredient here uh, for, for actually turning the tide here. It's if, if the problem is misinformation plus distrust, the answer is correct information delivered via a trusted relationship. So we wanna provide the videos as trusted information. We're inviting pastors and other leaders in the community to be the trusted relationship that's passing this along especially through social media, where really a lot of this battle is being waged. You know, you said something that was so near and dear to our hearts uh, in Science for the Church, among other important things in what you just mentioned, the relationships. Uh, we think that that's key for understanding science because there can be, uh, you know, this distrust of science as well in the church. And when pastors and, of course, scientists, in this case, medical scientists, bring good information through relationship. That's incredibly important. And, um, you know, I, I guess, Curtis, if there's um, one question that I wonder about personally is, do you find yourself uh, getting discouraged in light of how, how much there is against, uh, I think, you know, what you're trying to do? I mean, there are very powerful forces 
against the work that you're trying to do to help Christians understand uh, vaccinations and the importance of getting vaccinated against COVID? Wow, that's a, you're the first person that's asked me that question in an interview, and it's such a perceptive question, mm -hmm. Greg. I, I do fight that, um, you know, sense that that we're up against such large, strong cultural forces in play. Um, I think I come back to just my biblical understanding of calling and the sense of, you know, for me, how I encapsulate all of the biblical theology of calling is in this image of, or, and, and sort of visceral sense of answering the bell. Like God just rings a bell right. and you hear and you realize, yep, that's my bell. And you don't know what the outcome is. You have, you're not doing it because you feel like you've got the recipe for success, for guaranteed success. Um, you just answer the bell. Yeah. And you, you leave up the results up to God. And so I'm trying to stay in that place myself. It's a struggle because I like to win. Um, I'm also very hyper competitive. And I, uh, the, the thought of these external forces of hijacking my people, my flock, broadly speaking, uh, infuriates me. <laughs> and it gets all my competitive juices flowing. So I have to confess that. <laughs> I, with, my, with my best self, um, I know I, all I can do is, is uh, do my best and, and do what God's called me to. And like the parable of the sower, put good seed out there. And so these videos on Christians of Vaccine are, I think, the, the, the seed that at least God has entrusted to me to cast out there. And I can only just trust the, the work of the kingdom for that seed to find the soil that it's supposed to. Well, you mentioned Philippians uh, a moment ago, which is, by the way, my favorite book in the Bible. And I love that one of these other images that Paul uses of uh, striving to get together, sunath leo. So as a competitor, Maybe we can compete together to, you know, help get the information out uh, with Christians in the vaccine.com with science for the church. We're going to have your resources. We already do, but we'll have additional resources uh, available. Um, and I just want to ask you if there's something you wanted to say one last takeaway before uh, we wrap it up. Yeah. I, I want to speak to the pastors and the scientists that are out there listening, which I believe you have in your listenership that this is the moment for us, for you to step up. Um, you know, we have been in an era where it's been so, uh, so discouraging uh, in terms of how polarized and divided and either with our, within our congregations or in our extended family networks or with our friends where we discover what you believe that. Um, and that it's been the temptation to pull into our own shells is so strong. And I understand that, but I wanna say, this is the moment for us to say no more, no more can we allow these external forces to, as thieves and wolves, to come in to steal the hearts and minds of, of our friends, of our fellow church members, of our family members, and that we've got to step up. The, stepping up doesn't mean combatively, it doesn't mean just you know, arguing with them, but it does mean uh, expressing interest, asking questions, seeking to understand and empathize with where people are at, and then looking for ways to engage. And one of the ways that I hope that even the, the, uh, for these videos is that it can be sort of like an excuse for a scientist to, to actually, you know, maybe you're the scientist, the most educated uh, scientist in, in an extended family network. Um, and they, they do kind of look up to you, but you also know you guys think really differently about some things that maybe the, this video is an opportunity for you to just share that along with your network and say, hey, I really think this is good. I think you guys should take a look at it. And I'd love to talk about it if you're interested. Um, and that that could be a way to reopen these lines of communication that have gotten so strained in this past uh, past couple of years, especially this past year. And then also the pastors that are listening is that this really is the moment for us to protect our flock uh, from the thieves and wolves that would steal the very health of our congregation and our individual members. Uh, it's our moment. We've got to do it. And we've got to be willing to pay the costs, maybe not by preaching on Sunday morning, but by in some way exercising the trust that you do have uh, as a pastor and to play the role of the shepherds of the flock. Wow. Boy, that hits right here, I'll tell you. And I'm really thankful, Curtis, for the way that you've responded to the call of this moment. Um, yeah, I, I'm a little bit speechless. So thank you for every, all of your insights. And once again, the website is christiansandthevaccine.com. Curtis, it's been really my pleasure to talk with you. It's been great to be with you. And I look forward to striving together on this with science for the church and with you, Greg. Thank you.